So good afternoon and welcome to Art History with the Artists and the Librarian. I'm Sarah Burris. I'm the Community Relations and Marketing Coordinator for the Bay County Public Library and the Northwest Regional Library System. And today's program is going to introduce you to an artist that I am really excited to present on. I didn't know too much about her, so I was really excited to dive in and learn more. Um, but Edmonia Wildfire Lewis, and she is um, very impressive. So I really hope that you leave knowing a little bit more about her, her sculptures and her life. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and I will, I'll go through some of the questions afterwards as well. So let's begin. Okay, so Mary Edmonia Lewis, uh, she was named Wildfire at birth was born in 1844 to her Native American mother who made souvenirs for tourists and her Haitian African American father, Samuel Lewis, who was a gentleman's servant. Her mother, Catherine Mike Lewis, had an artesian background, which is most likely where Edmonia got her, her artistic talents from. So her mother did a lot of basket weaving and moccasins, and so was really working with her hands in three-dimensional objects. Edmonia was orphaned at a young age, um, and then she was raised by her Ojibwe um, aunts that lived kind of close to Niagara Falls in Upper New York. Um, her half-brother, uh, Samuel, he moved to California. He started off as a barber, and then he did really well in the gold rush. So he was able to finance Edmonia's education, which is pretty fantastic. In 1859, Mary Edmonia Lewis was 15 and left to attend Oberlin Academy Prep School and then the Oberlin College in, in, uh, in Ohio. Oberlin was one of the few schools that would allow both women and African-American students. She was one of 30 African-American students at the school at the time. However, even though Oberlin was known for its abolitionist roots, as well as progressive values, she did face a lot of discrimination while she was attending school. One of the most notable events was in 1862. She was falsely accused of poisoning two white classmates. Um, that she had had over for like a little get together and had wine and the two other students got ill and she did not and she actually had a mob attack her after that. She took the case to court and won, which is very impressive. She was able to win the case. However, then she was accused again of stealing art supplies. She took that case to court and won again, but was not able to finish her studies at Oberlin. So a historical reminder that the instance when she was attending, um, she started Oberlin in 1859 and the incidents were in 1862. So this is during the time frame of the Civil War. The Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865. The piece that is depicted here on the left is one of her earliest surviving works. And I wanted to show it because it kind of shows where she began the neoclassical, um, her neoclassical works. Um, it's a piece of Urania holding a spear and a tool, which looks a lot like this cast. Um, and the cast, the plaster cast is a based on a classical Hellenistic or original statue from 150 to 100 BCE. And Urania in Greek mythology was the muse of astronomy. The drawing itself, um, a lot of times the plaster cast would be used as almost like an educational tool. Ah, yes, the chat box can cover up the statue. But the statue, this is the one that looks closest to the drawings, I'm assuming that is the one that was used for a reference. This is one of her earliest surviving works and the drawing itself, if you notice, um, there's a little bit of a brown splotch next to the face. So that was most likely a um, candle wax from when she was drawing the piece because she most likely would have been drawing during candle light. And um, so that would have been something that took place while the drawing was taking place. And um, this has been donated to the Oberlin College Archives and it has a very detailed description, which is fantastic. So the piece was made for a friend and classmate, Clara Steele Norton as a wedding gift in 1862. And the family 
passed it down from generation to generation, then they donated it to Oberlin College. Um, and the feathers and the drawing and both the drawing and the sculpture remind me of Edmonia Lewis's later works, which we'll go into when she depicts Native American drawing on her indigenous heritage. So um, just the, especially the sculpture, the way it's positioned or, or the proportions, but it has a little bit in the drawing as well. So after leaving Oberlin, Edmonia Lewis relocated to Boston where she was really begin, able to begin her career as an artist. The prominent abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison introduced Lewis to self-taught marble sculptor Edward Augustus Brackett. So this is him on the left. He looks like he'd be a character. I just love that beard. And so she trained with Brackett for about two years. One moment, I have a frog in my throat. And Lewis is quoted as saying that a man who made the uh, a bust of John Brown must be a friend of my people. And so this is a sculpture that's on the right. So if your chat box is in the way, please relocate it more to the middle. Um, this is the John Brown, Brown sculpture that I wanted to chat about just briefly. And Brackett was actually able to see the abolitionist, uh, abolitionist Brown in jail after the Harper Ferry raid and was able to take measurements in person. There was even cabinet cards or photographs of the sculpture that were passed around within the anti-slavery movement. So during this time, Edmonia Lewis was creating medallions of abolitionists, including John Brown for funding her, um, she wanted to relocate to Italy. And this clip from the William Lloyd Garrison's The Liberator magazine states, the subscriber invites the attention of her friends and the public to a number of medallions of John Brown just completed by her and which may be seen at room number 89, studio building Tremont Street, Boston, January 29th, 1864, Edmonia Lewis. There are no surviving um, copies of the 100 John Brown medallions that she created, but those aesthetics probably were very heavily based on the John Brown um, that Brackett had done. I do have an example of a medallion. And so the medallions are not fully three-dimensional. It's partially three-dimensional. It's just a little bit of a raised surface. So it's probably great practice just to get a little bit of marble training. This is a Wendell Phillips marble medallion that may have looked similar to John Brown's in 1864. This one was based on photographs and I just love the tufts of hair and all the details that she has right there. And Wendell Phillips was a contributor to the Liberator magazine and contributed financially to the abolitionist cause. In 1865, he was president of the American Anti-Slavery Society. He was also pro women's rights and for universal suffrage for the right to vote for all. And I really wanted to share um, this piece that's on the, the right so that you can pair it up with one of Brackett's pieces to kind of see where his training may be kind of seen in her work as well, though she has her own distinct style. The, um, there's the side-by-side -side comparison of Brackett's Washington Alston and Edmonia Lewis's Robert Oldshaw. Though hers is, it's much softer in detail. And I think part of that might be she's a new sculptor. So you might be a little bit more nervous to make those real distinct cuts into the marble. Um, but it is also very much her own style when you see her other works. But the overall form of the bust is very similar in how it's kind of cut and how the pedestal is, is set. So Edmonia Lewis watched the 54th Massachusetts Regiment depart out of Boston on May 28th, 1863, which was led by Robert Goldshaw and loaded they, the, the troops loaded to transport towards the South. It's estimated that 20,000 individuals came to see the 54th Massachusetts Regiment march, and many were anti-slavery. And this volunteer infantry was the first where African-American soldiers fought courageously for the Union and by choice. And this unit's bravery is what encouraged a lot of others to enlist. Shaw was unfortunately killed at the Battle of Fort Wagner, South Carolina. And if you look closely on his sculpture, Right under the bust, you can see Martyr for Freedom is inscribed into the statue. 
it, if you watch the um, 1989 film Glory, uh, Colonel Shaw is played by Matthew Broderick. So I don't know if you remember that film. The 54th Regiment suffered, suffered tremendous casualties at Fort Wagner. 42% were killed, wounded, or captured. Robert Gold Shaw's family approved of Edmonia Lewis's design of the bust once it was complete. And then the Boston Colored Ladies Sanitary Commission created a Soldiers Relief Fund Fair and in November 1864. So the funding for that went towards the soldiers. And so it went towards specifically three African American regiments in Massachusetts. Lewis sold 100 plaster replicas of the Shaw piece, as well as photographs of the piece. And, and that all went into the relief fund fair. This helped the soldiers and it also did help her finance her way into Italy. In response to Robert Goldshaw's sculpture by Edmonia Lewis, American poet Anna Quincy Waterston wrote a poem entitled Edmonia Lewis about her artistic talent. So it's specific to Edmonia's artistic talents. And here's just a few lines of it. Tis fitting that a daughter of the race whose chains are breaking should receive a gift so rare as genius, neither power nor place, fashion or wealth, pride, custom, caste, nor hue can arrogantly claim what God doth lift upon these chances and bestows on few. Anna Quincy Waterston and her husband, Reverend Robert C. Waterston from the Boston area they helped fund Edmonia Lewis's um, first marbles when she arrived in Italy. And um, she, uh, Edmonia Lewis would often carve portraits of her patrons, either as a commission or in gratitude for their financial support. And I think this one's just a beautifully detailed piece, even just like the, the braid and the back and all of the lace right here. Um, it's just very delicate details. The hair is probably my favorite part of it. Um, no plastic, plaster. So I'm probably just not pronouncing things correctly. It would be plaster cast. So that was around um, a lot of plaster casting. Uh, even, even in the Renaissance, they would have plaster casting. Edmonia Lewis re relocated to Rome, Italy in 1865. And she's quoted in the New York Times in 1878 with this quote, um, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art and culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. So when she moved to Italy, uh, Edmonia Lewis learned Italian. She became immersed with a group of female expats um, including the notable marble sculptor, Harry Hosmer, which I hadn't heard of Harry Hosmer either. So um, it, this was, was a really fun um, uh, side dive. Uh, the picture on the left, especially, I love. Edmonia preferred to, um, well, Rome was the place to be for marble sculpture. It still probably is the place to be for marble sculpture. And because there's high quality marble as well as the, the skilled carvers to learn from. And Edmonia preferred to carve all of her pieces herself. She wanted everyone to know that that was her piece. It wasn't an Italian carver doing it for her. Um, and Hosmer was the same way. However, this picture on the left is a lot of her studio assistants. I don't know how much they would have helped with her actual pieces. I think she was trying to do her work as well. Um, but maybe there was duplicates that they were working on or something of her work. And Harriet Hosmer was, of course, this, this picture from her studio courtyard is from Rome, 1867. And Hosmer really helped pave a path for Lewis. Um, there was, you know, a small group of them that worked together and were friends and they kind of built connections for each other. So Hosmer's work is also neoclassical. This is, this is the period where that is popular to do. Um, and it's based off of the Hellenistic or classical Greek and Roman mythologies. 
The Sleeping Fawn on the, the right is one of um, Hosmer's most notable works. And Harriet Hosmer enjoyed humor. So if you look on the right, there's a tiny mischievous satyr and it is tying the woodland fawn to a tree stump. So I, it's a funny little detail. Um, so I hope you, you catch that. Back to Edmonia. So Edmonia Lewis, her studio was once Antonio Canova's and he is the Italian sculptor that really brought neoclassic back into vogue in the kind of like maybe 1830s, 1840s timeframe. His work is awesome as well if you wanna check him out. Um, but having that studio space, I think was also a benefit to her. Edmonia Lewis's studio was one to visit for prominent Americans touring and traveling in Rome. Frederick Douglass and his wife even stopped by her studio in the 1890s. Lewis carved Forever Free in 1867 of a black man free from the bonds of slavery and a black woman kneeling in prayer to commemorate the ratification of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery in the United States. And it is now housed at the Howard University Gallery of Art Collection. It's a piece of hope for the future and originally entitled Morning of Liberty. In addition to carving patrons, abolitionists, and the African-American experience, Edmonia was one of the first to feature Native Americans in her sculpture from her experience growing up as part of the Ojibwe Nation. She is bringing more contemporary narratives that are personal to her and stylizing them in a neoclassical way. This piece, Indian Combat, is unusual showcasing three figures. Most of hers are, are two or less. Remember that um, this carving is completely done by her and um, it's very full of action. So this is very different from like the medallions or some of her earlier bust. Um, this one shows movement and the details. There's a lot of negative space in there. So when working on a carving like this, they most she most likely had a clay sculpture that she was did first and then maybe did a, a plaster cast from that and then used that as a reference point before diving into the marble because it's a lot easier to add than to subtract. Whereas if you're working with marble, you're, you're, it's a hundred percent subtraction. So if you make a mistake, that's a big mistake. It's really hard to fix. And these two pieces are really beautiful. Hiawatha and Minnehaha are characters from an epic poem by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow written in 1855. He wrote the song of Hiawatha, which was revered at the time though today it's seen a little bit as more misguided or romanticized. Hiawatha on the, the left is a Ojibwe warrior who falls in love with a Dakota maiden, Minnehaha, who was on the right. Um, and they were, it was Dakota and Ojibwe would be once um, warring Native American nations. So these fictionalized star-crossed lovers were, um, idealized very much like the classical Greek mythologies. The poem was a cultural sensation at the time and one where Native Americans were portrayed in a positive light and seen as heroic. Uh, if you read much literary work from that time period, it's often not the case and Native Americans were often not shed in a positive light. So Lewis really appreciated Longfellow's take on her Ojibwe heritage. And here is another one um, um, inspired by the poem um, called Hiawatha's Marriage. And it was sculpted after the Civil War. So some interpretations of this piece, because it's a marriage of warring nations, Hiawatha from the Ojibwe nation and Minnehaha being from the, the Dakota nation, to symbolize that reunification of the North and the South post-Civil War. One line from the poem is that old feuds might be forgotten and old wounds may be healed forever. Um, and looking at her work, you can still see it's very stylistic to Edmonia Lewis. There is a softness in the carvings and the subject matter is very distinct to, to her work as well. And there is some more pieces based off the poem. 
Old Arrow Maker um, is also inspired by Song of Hiawatha. At the doorway of his wigwam sat the ancient arrow maker. At his side in all her beauty sat the lovely Minnehaha. So those are just a few lines from the poem that she is depicting in this sculpture. So I'm just gonna reiterate that the modeling process would most likely have been clay to plaster cast. This one actually notes the model and carving dates. And um, so it's much easier to work in that clay. You can add more details and it's really hard to backtrack when you're carving into something where you can't really, you can only take away, you can't really add. Not as many room for edits. And so this one was modeled in 1868 and carved in 1872. I do feel the proportions of this one are just a little off. I feel his head is a little larger than in perspective than it should be. Um, the proportions are just a little strange in comparison to hers. And even in his body, like I feel like the head is a little large. We, um, we know how much uh, she really, really admired Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. So Edmonia Lewis carved not one, but two busts of the American poet. One is housed in Harvard University where Longfellow had been faculty. Lewis discovered that Longfellow was in Rome during 1869. So she kind of like fangirl stalked him for a little while and was doing sketches close to where he was staying. She like heard that he was there and like, oh, that's where that's where his hotel is. So she would get some distant sketches and then she went up and talked to him and, and talked him into sitting so that she could get the measurements and, and, um, and work on a sculpture of him. If, if she was able to do a clay sculpture with him in person, that would probably be the most ideal. And Longfellow was also an abolitionist and she just really admired him. Okay, so here is a carte de visite. Um, a calling card style photograph of Edmonia Lewis circa 1874 through 1876. The photography studio was around the corner from her studio in Rome. And this photograph was purchased at an antique shop in Baltimore. Edmonia tr did travel back to the United States a few times during while she was living in Rome for like specific projects. So this one, she most likely went to Baltimore in 1863, because she was working um, to install a piece called the Adoration of the Magi or um, the Chapel of St. Mary's, a congregation of African-American Episcopalians in Baltimore. And there's not a lot of photographic evidence of the piece. I think there's one online if you wanna look for it, um, but it seemed like it was cited to someone. I didn't wanna use it just in case for citations reasons, but it's a, like a kind of a half semicircle piece where um, it's a, a boss relief marble sculpture of three wise men, Mary and Joseph holding the baby Jesus. And the what's notable about this piece is out of the three wise men, the African wise man is the one that's most prominent in the piece. The church itself had a devastating fire in February 5th, 1947. So the both the church as well as the marble sculpture, unfortunately, were destroyed. What's interesting is that this resurfaced pretty recently. So, and a lot of her works would have been passed along in private collections. So I'm really hopeful that more of Edmonia Lewis's works will resurface because um, there is a very distinct stylization of her work. So I think that we could identify it in a later date. And, um, and perhaps some of the families that own a piece by her will donate it to a public collection. Oh, and this is my random note. Um, so you can't tell really in the picture. And I think this is because I'm very petite as well, but Edmonia Lewis was just over four feet tall. So not only is she in a, a men's dominated field of working in sculpture, a medium that requires physical strength. And she is, on, she's very petite. So I, I just thought that was very fascinating. And she did all of the modeling and chiseling of those marble sculptures herself. So when she was in Rome, Edmonia Lewis was a practicing Catholic and she was a Catholic um, for the rest of her life. Um, 
her works did fall in line with more with the Catholic Church as well. So this piece is Hagar, also known as Hagar in the Wilderness. It's one from a story from the Old Testament where Hagar was an enslaved Egyptian servant to Abraham's wife, Sarah, and also the mother of Abraham's first son, Ishmael. So the jealous Sarah cast Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness after Sarah is finally able to conceive a child of her own for, for their, um, Abraham's second son, Isaac. So this parallels the freedom from slavery in the United States. Hagar is a courageous heroine and God heard her cries and rescued them, both her and her son and the family then prospered. Edmonia Lewis is quoted to have said, I have strong sympathy for all women who have struggled and suffered. Knight, two sleeping children received a gold medal at the Naples Academy of Art in the early 1870s. These are two cherubs, a boy and a girl, sleeping with delicately sculpted flowers. And cherubs, which can also be called pudi, which I think is really fun to say, where pucho is the singular version. Um, really, it's a popular um, visual allegory in Renaissance art. So you're gonna see, if she's in Rome, she's gonna see little cherub-like figures everywhere, or, or pudi. Um, and it would just have been surrounding her in Italy. There is an additional sculpture that pairs with this one where they are awake. But I didn't find the image for that one. But she's starting to get more skilled in her, in her skill sets. And especially in looking at this one, um, I think you can tell she's a little more daring and how far she's carving into the piece. It's still soft, but not quite as soft. Um, and the details, even the wings are much more detailed. So this piece is called Poor Cupid and it's another neoclassical piece by Edmonia Lewis. The use of negative space is really interesting. Um, you can tell she's improving her skill sets and she has engraved Poor Cupid right in the front. So there's like no confusion who this is. So this is also a neoclassical piece referencing classical mythologies. Uh, Cupid is caught in a trap while he's trying to pick up a rose. And these scenes are popular in just the Victorian era. Uh, the classical era is being romanticized. So even tourists are trying to, they wanna buy these pieces for their home. Um, another name for this piece is Love and Snare. Cupid is usually winged. And he's known as the god of love, and he's the son of Venus and um, Roman goddess of love and son of Mercury, the winged messenger to the gods. And since Edmonia Lewis was in Italy, she's able to replicate Italian marble masters. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of pictures where people will be painting while viewing, um, going to like the Louvre or, or any place in Italy. Um, the, the sculpting was done very similarly. You could either, I don't know, bring, bring materials out and work on them directly or make sketches or you're studying straight from, from the masters. So that is quite an education. Uh, she is quoted to having have said, I thought I knew everything when I came to Rome, but I soon found I had everything to learn. So Michelangelo's Moses was, um, commissioned in 1505 by Pope Julius II for his tomb and located in Rome. So she would have been able to visit, visit it easily. And her replica is on the right. Not only does this help increase her skill sets um, and it's a stunning piece, she would have done these for American tourists stopping by. So it's an easy sell. Um, it's very popular at this time to own something that is fits the neoclassical or classical or antiquities. Um, even when I was working at the Ringling Museum of Art as an intern, John Ringling, that's in Sarasota, but John Ringling, uh, this is Gilded Era age, late 1800s, early 1900s. He had a catalog where you could literally order sculptures that were um, the classical sculptures and um, say what size you wanted it, if you wanted it tiny or if you wanted it really big. 
So if you go there, there's a really large Michelangelo David. So um, you could just order one and have it you know, sent to you. Um, it, it was in vogue, it was very popular, a, a level of sophistication. And I don't know if you remember our, our Isabella Gardner Museum in Boston, when we were talking about that, she was buying a lot of antiquities because that was popular and she was embedding them into her own. Okay, and this is the last piece I'm gonna share. Um, and it is one of her most notable pieces at this time. The death of Cleopatra is viewed as one of Edmonia Lewis's strongest sculptures today. And though it was very controversial when it was being created, because it portrays death, and not only does it portray death, it portrays Cleopatra's choosing of death. It was seen as rather ghastly in this Victorian era. It's right after the fatal bite of the asp. And so Queen um, Cleopatra, queen of Egypt from 51 to 30 BCE by her own hand. And it took about four years to carve. So that's a lot of detail work and a lot of work that goes into this piece. It was displayed at the Centennial Exposition of 1876 in Philadelphia. The People's Advocate paper stated that apart from a sculpture by Guanirio, the and I'm not pronouncing it correct for, for whoever the other sculptor is, but the death of Cleopatra excites more admiration and gathers larger crowds around it than any work of art in the vast collection of Memorial Hall. So that's quite an honor. However, there's a bit of a strange history with this piece. Um, it, it goes to Chicago in 1878, and then the two-ton sculpture, so it's very heavy marble sculpture, goes into storage. And then it was displayed in a Chicago saloon in 1892, and then it was won by a gambler Blind John Condon, who also owned racehorses. He had a racehorse named Cleopatra that died. So he put this sculpture as the tombstone for his racehorse named Cleopatra. And then the racetrack became a golf course. And it became a World War II torpedo plant. And then it became a US Postal Service. So it's like the sculpture is getting knocked around and moved around. Um, it ends up in a storage facility in the 70s, which they rediscover. They did find some photographic evidence and were able to pinpoint that it was Edmonia Lewis's piece. And then um, there was even a Boy Scout troop that was thought they were doing a good thing. There was some repairs that needed to be done. So they like painted it. So you can't imagine like, oh, that's a lot of layers of stuff to rework. But eventually, it ends up at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and they restore it to the best of their abilities. Not all of the pieces like the side, the arms with the Sphinx, which are supposed to represent her twins, um, their noses are still broken off. And the hieroglyphics on the side, even though they represent hi hieroglyphics, they don't actually say anything. Um, it's just more aesthetic. I hope you enjoyed the sampling of work that I've provided so far. Um, and in so many ways, her work's ahead of its time, just providing, uh, it's almost conceptual in the way she chose her subjects and the subject matter, um, having kind of dual meanings. And after studying her work, I really appreciate her stylization and that she did all the carving herself. Edmonia Lewis was a wildfire like her Ojibwe namesake, stubborn, courageous, inventive, and incredibly talented. So unfortunately, her, her death um, was a lot harder to follow because census records reveal that she had relocated to London in 1901, and she died in Hammersmith Infirmary of Wright's disease in 1907. And she was buried in London. She wanted, um, her requests were a dark walnut coffin and a notice of her death to be printed. However, the, the death notice was not shared overseas and it wasn't widely publicized. So it didn't even say that she was a sculptor. So it got kind of lost in the shuffle. And um, so historic researchers, including Marilyn Richardson, 
and Bobby Reno were able to locate Ammonia Lewis's unmarked grave and with crowdfunding purchased a black marble headstone at the St. Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in London. So it was formerly known as grave C350. And now there is an official gravestone that is beautifully placed there in 2017. So over a hundred years after her death. And the recommended reading that I have, really it's one, I put the two, books that we have in our collection, but one is the one that I will recommend. And that is Seeing True Stories of Marginalized Trailblazers, Edmonia Lewis. And this is a graphic novel. It's very small, um, so it won't take long to read. And I think my thing is mirrored, but it's beautifully illustrated. I'm all over the place. And um, it's geared for your, your teen age and up. And so the end actually has like teaching guides and questions um, to kind of get you thinking. So I think it's really cleverly done with this series and the scene series just started. Uh, the other one that's been published is um, on race, Rachel Carson. So I'm really curious what other ones they're gonna feature. Um, I'd love to see more. And it really follows everything that I was researching really well. So that's the one I would recommend. The other one that we have in the collection is called Stone Mirrors by Janine Atkins, but it's poetry. So I think you have to really know Edmonia Lewis so that you can understand the poetry because it's poetry about her. And so it's like a fictionalized, I, I couldn't get into it yet, but maybe you are the person to be able to analyze it for me. Um, here are some additional resources. So I was also able to find a lot of research at the, um, all the, the museum to have the pieces as well. Um, I have a few projects I wanted to kind of highlight. I don't know when the next art history class is gonna be. It's been really hard for me to do research um, and squeeze it in. So I hope I can do another one in the winter, but we'll see. I don't think I'll be able to get one in the next two months. Um, if you enjoyed this one and haven't seen a uh, art history talk before, if you go to the Northwest Regional Library System YouTube channel, we have more art history programs. There's Mary Cassatt, Van Gogh, um, maybe someone that you would, you would like to learn more about and don't know yet. And the art heist one was fun as well. And um, I've been working a lot on our BCPL Unstacked podcast. So you can follow the podcast wherever you follow podcasts. And um, I follow it on Apple Podcast. We've been doing a lot of author interviews. And that's why I wanted to mention, because there's some similarities in the creative process as an artist and a writer. So if you're interested in learning more about the creative process, you don't even have to like their style because there's been a lot of horror authors lately. And I think it's my co-host, um, Stephen, he really likes horror, so we've been getting a lot of them to interview, and they're very skilled, talented authors, and I've been enjoying the books, but if that's not your cup of tea, you still might be interested in learning about their creative process. Um, a lot of great reads. Uh, some of the other authors include Marie Bostwick or Kristen Harmel, um, Amy Stewart, and uh, Chuck Wendig. Uh, the programming is gonna either remain virtual or really small in scale. Uh, next Tuesday, um, we're gonna have a small program at the library at 4 p.m. September 21st, and it's gonna be photographer Kim Mixon-Hill, and she's gonna talk about her works from abandoned Northwest Florida and after the storm. So um, it's gonna be limited to 15 people, but if you come early, there should be a spot, and um, her work will be on display at the library through September, so I recommend visiting. And now for questions. The question is um, that the, there's not a lot of African-American features in her sculptures. So let's just backtrack to see some of her pieces. I think part of it is because it is pairing with the um, neoclassical style, because even these faces have more of like, if you pull up class, the neoclassical Sculptures, they're really modeled heavily after how they would have looked for the, the Greek or, so it is, is there isn't a distinct 
difference too much, but there is a little bit. Um, so I don't have the best answer for that. I think there's probably gonna be some more research, but if you really kind of compare her work to classical works, which is what she's modeling her work off of, I think that might be why. Yeah, I think, let, let me know if you do more re research, we'll have to dig into that one. And do we have any more questions? I thank you guys so much for joining me. I hope you learned something new. And I hope you um, kind of dive further into her work. I really hope we discover some new pieces. <laughs>